Good morning, Misfits. You are tuning nice. into another episode of the Misfit Podcast. Full goon squad in the house. Here Even big red sunburnt Sherb, Sherb if you're watching Sherb on not YouTube. In the house. Sherb is not in the house. I'm outside of a house. Yeah, your internet shows. Sick. <laughs> you might be going you might be going back inside the house. <laughs> fucking um, potat. <laughs> it worked great up until the fucking podcast starting. Amazing. Keep going. On today's show, we're going to be talking about how you can use what I consider to be one of the founding principles of CrossFit and why CrossFit has worked so well as a methodology to improve both as an athlete and a coach. But before we get to that, the best way to support this show is by heading to properfuel.co, use the code word MISFIT, sharpentheaxco.com, use your favorite athlete code, you save 10% on your order, and the athletes that are headed to semifinals save or they don't save anything they make 10 percent on the order uh sharpen the axe your favorite athlete pennies. code and of course teammisfit.com for your affiliate programming needs and misfitathletics.com for your individual programming needs Cheap. gentlemen what is going on in your lives really trying to cultivate that hot dog skin right now it's hot dog skin <laughs> season <laughs> Shitty internet season is what it is. Fuck. <laughs> All right, stand by. Don't you have hot dog skin life though, Sherb? What's wrong with that? We got a fucking hot dog joint opening up next door here in a minute. Open up this week. Hot dog joints? Hot dogs and joints? I wish. <laughs> Fuck. New new name of the podcast. <laughs> hot, hot dog and joints. And I'm joint. in. I'm interested. This is almost Fuck. as good as cigarettes and single unders. Still need to make that shirt. <laughs> almost. When you say hot dog joint, what do you mean? A place that slings hot dogs, Ted. Chicago dogs. What kind of hot dogs. Chicago, uh, I mean, I haven't seen the menu yet because they're not open. Love Chicago dogs. I mean, <clears throat> they like have an advertisement and they I could like peek into the photo because it's very blurry and I'm trying to read like the, what's on the menu for hot dogs and they're all like four dollars. So I'm guessing it's gonna be out of business in six months. So if you want a hot dog, come get it now. I hope they <laughs> last, but like there's always those like places and towns where like you call them a black hole because eventually they just close, and that's what this place is. Mm. So I'm hopeful for them. Be nice if they sta stayed because you know hot dogs across like, the parking lot is like, nice. It's <laughs> like where Guerrero Maya is right now, next to that, next to the Jeep or the car dealer. Black I hole was there. So many for a long time, Remember it? that was like the GMC, then it was like Dexter Shoes, and it was Wild Willie's <laughs> Burgers. Well, that's an original <laughs> Dexter Shoes. Like that's what all their buildings looked like. They had, all, they had them all over Maine. They and just then kept the building, left the no company. Yeah. <laughs> There's a burger joint in there for a while. I Wild remember. Willies. Yeah. yeah. Wild Willies. Trash. I Wild never went there. No good? I do love a good Chicago dog. No, I love fucking Chicago dogs, though. It's supposed to open up this week. Soft opening in the middle of this week and then hard opening on Saturday. So let's hope. Easy guy. <laughs> Put your pants uh, on. I haven't eaten hot dogs in a while. I'm still boycotting hot dogs. Um, my Why? favorite ketchup, they went out of business. Actually, no, they didn't. They stopped making ketchup. I still see their fucking... I tried to buy like a jug of Sir Kensington's ketchup on Amazon. <laughs> they don't make, they don't it, make it anymore. No, they don't make it anymore. They like I found an article because there are so many people that loved it. Um, people were complaining on the internet that they switched to other condiments for whatever fucking reason. Cowards. I just don't like most ketchup is too sweet for me. I'm not into it. Mm. Um, what I like to do is cook an entire package of hot dogs, no bun, and put bowl like of, bowl of ketchup. <laughs> yes, exactly. And then you just dip and rip. Um, and <laughs> Cody saw me do it once, and he asked me if I was okay, and he had like a very serious look on his face. And I was like, "This is status quo, my friend. I've downed a package of problem. hot dogs or two in my Ted day. does the same so. thing. He just doesn't cook the hot dogs." I freeze them. Straight, I like to have them frozen. frozen. Just straight frozen dogs. Nice. I did Cold eat a dog. lot of raw, I mean raw, quote unquote, raw hot dogs as a child. Oh, I would yeah. love just opening up the fridge and grabbing one of those bad boys. Fenway Frank and just yeah. off to the races. Cold dog in your hole. It's nice. Yeah. Makes uh, for a good weekend. Every once in a while at the turn at Nunsuch, I'll get a hot dog. And it's the old, like, the red boys. They're so good with the right. steamy, soggy Snappers. buns. 
the turn so fucking is good. that like the name of the golf cart that drives around selling dogs no it's after the ninth hole when you turn to go on to the back nine. hunters turning tricks at the so he can afford the back nine <laughs> <Fuck>. afford golf <laughs> that's actually no, speaking I'm of cody pace. and hot dogs that's why he hates hot dogs when he was a little kid he had a steamed hot dog at a golf course and puked or something and then he said ever since then steamed hot dogs he like dry heaves when he smells it <laughs> he's got one of those weird mm. weird things Noted. from childhood <laughs> some hot dog water send them a hot dog I'm bring a bottle of hot dog water Please do. A hot dog flavored candle. That's Flavor. a good idea. You eat your candles, last dog? I don't know how this is going to age, um, but my Boston Bruins are looking fucking good. They, they won last night. Last night? They, they played really well last night. They won 5 1 in Florida um, for game one. I'm, what I asked, so me, myself, my dad, and my brother talk about the Bruins pretty regularly during the playoffs. And I was like, is this monkey off their back because so last year they went they were up 3-1 on Florida and they lost they were up 3-1 on the Leafs this year and they went to game seven again and it was like are they do are they going to do it again and there were multiple games where it just looked like they weren't they were trying not to lose um they were they had it was like shots were like 18 to 1 um at one point in one of the games Bruins being the one um that's dope so the question that, is they win game good. seven is that monkey off their back or is it just Florida's better than them anyways and we'll see what the fuck happens. So I don't know, but last night was last night was great. You I mean it was it's not like it's one not... that's better than you though. That well, seems like a pretty Ted, how much do you know about hockey? Fucking playoff. About hockey. as much as me. I've watched a lot of <laughs> six year old hockey. I'm pretty you know, <laughs> is that compared <laughs> to the NHL? Strangely well? enough, the quality in the NHL is only slightly better. <laughs> it's just faster. <laughs> no one's been scoring this year. Why? Um defense and goaltending. I mean the 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 like way that they right now they're like if you have a good goaltender and your special teams are better um kickoff you unit? have a, a yes <laughs> yeah kickoff and receiving punting things of that nature now like penalty kill power play oh, okay. things like that those are the areas where if you excel in that you can have a like okay five on five team and still win in the playoffs but um i don't know i just fucking love playoff hockey it gets me fired up but i can't stay awake so there's that. <laughs> I fell asleep during like game eight. six and game seven. That's early. Yeah. Yeah. They're anywhere from 630 to 830 that they start. It's like, these are two East Coast teams. What are you doing to me right now? I fucking <laughs> yeah, the, eight, I the 830 hang. starts tough. Bullshit. Just drink some Red Bull. Power through it. I've tried. I still can't hang. It's too late, dog. Can't even yeah, watch like Monday Night Football anymore. Late. It's too late. Too late? What are you, grandpa? Yeah. <laughs> fucking fall asleep. After the first quarter, I'm old. Sure, we'll FaceTime Ted in with the kids at 536. <laughs> you could try. I won't hear my phone. Ted would definitely answer. Much. Definitely answer. <laughs> definitely. Anything else, gentlemen? Fuck. I mean, you guys watched the fucking roast of Tom Brady yet? Any of you guys? I told Drew too. I don't know if I, I think, I think I told Ted too. I don't I, think I told Hunter I too. I feel but like I, I ruined Kyle, it Kyle through it Instagram. It's fucking. I feel like I saw the, I feel like I saw the, the greatest hits. I mean, maybe you did. It's a good chance that you did, but fuck, that was so good. It was just three Andrew hours. Andrew Schultz of... went hard. Dude. That was awesome. That was great. His Dana White comment was fucking brilliant. <laughs> yeah, that Schultz so segment good. was really good. Did you hear I Dana's swear. comment yet? Did you hear <laughs> no. Dana's one minute bit? Goes, Wait, no. they put Dana on the mic? Yeah, so like Tony Hitchcliffe goes like, oh, I've got a fucking pot here. And I'm going to pull it a random name. Oh, look, it's Dana White. Like obviously pre-stage that he's going to have Dana White speak and Dana White sits up. He goes, First of all, fuck you, Netflix, for flying me all the way the fuck out here to give me 60 goddamn seconds. Am I not trans enough for you? My name's fucking Dana. And it Whoa. was like, that's like how he started his bit. Sure was, has to go there. Dude, it was wild. It was wild. I mean, it was just, it's a great <laughs> night of comedy. I fucking laughed my ass off. I was fucking, <laughs> put the kid to put Zion to bed and like, all right, we usually wait like 15 minutes to like be quiet in the house. So he'll like settle and fall asleep and put that on there. I'm like, I'm sorry. And I was like, you shut up. It's so, you're so fucking loud. I'm like, yeah, I know I am. <laughs> but it was fucking, I watched those, it. Those roasts, they get like the dudes that are basically world class at making fun of people into a room and they're like, have at it, like write the jokes. There's so many people watch those and they think that like Dana White wrote the joke or oh, I know. Kim Kardashian <laughs> wrote her joke. Dude, and it's when like, when yeah. Gronk's doing his thing, he's no. like, I actually made that joke and it was like the worst joke of all the jokes <laughs> that he taught. And I was like, 
penis joke gay. And I was like, jeez, Kronk, it's all you have to say? <laughs> that was literally his entire, like, five-minute bit. Which, you know, surprising. Yeah, surprising. Surprise. <laughs> but yeah, all right, I'd everyone, watch it. Uh, go watch the hours. Tom Brady roast on, on Netflix. It's a good watch. Laugh loud enough that your kids wake up. They wake up. Maybe they did. I don't know. <laughs> All right, fine. You guys are fucking boring today. Um, so I believe that one of the reasons why CrossFit took off and why definitely we gravitated towards it and um, – yeah, I'll leave the pretense at that. So basically just the idea is we've got all of these modalities that we're jamming into. You know, you've got your track and field and your Olympic weightlifting and your powerlifting and your gymnastics. And one of the things that was kind of fun and funny about the beginning of CrossFit was Glassman was bringing those people in to teach us like really how to dig into the nuance and the specialty of movement and you know, how they programmed and how they trained, how they did all of these things while all of them were like, CrossFit's stupid. It's a fucking fad. Your shoulders are going to fall off. And again, we were like, oh no, you guys are the ones that know what you're talking about. We'll bring you in to have the experts. So I, that was kind of a funny dichotomy during that period of time. Um, but what it taught me, um, both from an athletic standpoint and a coaching standpoint, is that these people that you feel like you're potentially at odds with or competing with, or, you know, sometimes we even see in a coaching staff, certain coaches don't like each other because the other one possesses an attribute that they want. And the way that they show it is by talking shit about the attributes that the coach doesn't have. Um, so I think going into training and looking at how other people move and how other people train and you go into coaching and you know, we talk about creating the super coach here at misfit gym where you watch someone who's charismatic who commands a room someone who really has sort of the technical um you know in, in terms of movement in terms of explaining the workouts um, people who are great at helping people scale, but just this concept of bringing all of this knowledge and information in to improve yourself as a coach and an athlete, um, I think is so powerful. And that feels almost against human nature, right? We have this like tribalism where we want to, you know, double down on what our role is um, and the ability to take on attributes of other people and learn from them, um, again, from both sides of the fence, I think is is something that everybody in the entire you know space needs to learn how to do i talk to the coaches often about that in in wyndham because i'll hear them coaching and sure. they'll can you say, just like move your mic instead of <laughs> laying on top of your computer to talk into it is there room for it <laughs> all right now we say <laughs> you're welcome I hope that's the, thumb, that's, that's the thumbnail. That's, that has the to be the thumbnail. That's the thumbnail of the podcast. Oh, I just say, I talk to the, uh, just to the affiliate Christ. coaches often about like, when you give a, deliver a point, you don't need to like attribute it to the person you got it from. Because they'll say, Sherb says this in class. And Sherb says, I'm like, don't do that. Where do you think all the things I say came from? They're not original thoughts. They're things that I learned and synthesized into bite-sized chunks that I can deliver to class you should do the exact same thing. And if you don't know why you are saying what you're saying, don't say it. But then go out and figure out what you don't know. Like put those things on a list of like, why did I tell someone to do this? And figure out why you would say that so that you're armed for the next time you do it. So there's some ownership and understanding like what you're trying to deliver your class. But you need to come from a, a, a place of authority. And that does take practice. And the only way you get that, like practice and that confidence is through learning. You have to be someone who's willing to say, I don't know something and then go experience that. It's very very often still in class, we're like, I don't know the answer to that, but I'll have it for you next time you're here. Yeah, the um, thing that comes to mind for me is the when you get to see other really high-level coaches coach and just get to kind of pick out the things that it's, it's obviously easy to be a little bit self-conscious and compare yourself to that person and say, oh, they, they do that so well. Uh, like, I wish I could do, you know, I wish I could do it the same way that they do. And you kind of have to recognize that there's like someone else is probably saying that about you. Hopefully someone else is saying that about you or you, you know, you've got some room to improve. But um, I think like, you know, when I watched, uh, when I went to the affiliate summit, there was, we had like, there was a mini like, not not a class but denise thomas basically taught 
like a group of the affiliate owners like had an overhead squat and it was like oh shit like and that was it was cool because that looked it looked a lot like what we might do at our gym um there was probably a little bit less charisma involved i think that's a that's a skill that like that I don't know. I have variable opinions on that, mostly because I'm not the most charismatic person in the world, so I don't think it's that you? important. But, um, shut the fuck uh, up. Hold Ted, on, though. Please. So that that this is this is a, we'll do. A, um, Sherb and I will therapize Hunter right now. Um, so <laughs> therapize. One like one thing up. that's an issue here the are the labels, right? So this is an issue across the board. People are really fucking good at labeling themselves. Like I am this, um, and a lot of times it's subconsciously planted by like life experience. It doesn't have anything to do with your genetics or your personal capabilities. Um, and it's always fun for me to see someone say something like, I'm not creative or I'm not this and I'm not that. And then you see those glimpses of those things in that person in a particular moment. And it's like, you got to, you kind of just got to open up and run with that a little bit. And I'm all about, um, as you guys know, the fucking linear progression. And it's just like, if this, if, if I'm a two out of 10 on, on this spectrum and someone else is a nine out of 10, can I be a three? And then can I be a four? And what did it take for me to be able to do that? Um, and we all know how momentum works just in terms of being able to get yourself to a point where you can do that. So I would argue that I've seen, you hunter in specific instances where you were charismatic i think there's mm. just that idea of the labeling of like someone probably told somebody else that they were charismatic or they had a you know a parent or a coach or something that was when they were young and they learned from them but um so many of these things um you know one of the notes i made was to get into the fixed mindset versus the growth mindset but like these things are changeable for a coach and for an athlete, I think, in almost all instances. And the only question that we're ever asking ourselves is, can we improve from what we are right now to what we want to be? Like, we're not going to meet, we're not going to snap our fingers and, you know, all of a sudden be fucking Johnny Bravo in two seconds. Um, you know, Joe Cool, Hunter Wood. Um, but Hunter Cool. I think that our capability of improving um opens up substantially when we stop like just being like this is who i am this is the label that i've i've got for myself and you know that's sort of how it is it probably starts too with like a recognition that maybe you do find yourself in that more fixed fixed mindset first and then yeah you know whether it's asking somebody or talking to somebody about it and or just you know even even having someone close to you who who you can say like hey how do you how do you perceive me because i've had i've had an instance where i actually it was a couple of weeks ago um kind of an embarrassing moment i was having a pretty rough rough like week couple weeks i'd say really and a member asked a question uh and the the response that i gave was was bad was poor it was not it was not not very empathetic it was very much like um it just it just wasn't a good response and i ended up actually having to apologize to that member afterwards cuz it was a little bit of a time crunch and it was a question that i was like not prepared to address um and i i spoke with them after and it wasn't a big deal but i then i actually talked to one of my friends afterward and i was like just i, I was again like kind of having a rough day and i called him and i was like hey man like kind of having a shit day i don't do this very often but i just need to like mention this like that i'm having a bad day and i told explained to him like the situation that you know in class because he was also in class so he was like a, a third party witness to it yeah. and his response was like i didn't think your response was like was negative at all like i like it was the question that was asked was not necessarily appropriate for like the moment like we were trying to get rolling and Maybe it wasn't the perfect response, but I also didn't think it was like inappropriate by any means. And um, my like my own perception of what happened was was way different than what, you know, that unbiased third party who was just participating in class and just observed it um, still like had to apologize to that member to make sure they didn't think that you know, I was being a shithead or not intentionally anyway, but it's just a good, it's just a reminder that like the way that you see things is, is almost certainly not the way that everybody else does. Um, and 
You got like the yeah, seven most seven, embarrassing seven, moments seven, of your life that play on repeat if you wake up at 3 a.m. and no one else on earth remembers that they happen for sure or yeah, exist absolutely. like at all. Yeah. And our perception in those moments. And that's part of that is part of the growth is is the like super uncomfortable moment of I've been working on this. Like this is a moment where it's either could I have answered this in like kind of a different way or am I just going to like go down the rabbit hole of like what a fucking dumb answer why did I you know why did I do that um yeah I've never so so an exercise that I do yeah an exercise that I'll do at least yearly if not more often um comes from and I've I apologize for mentioning this book like every nine episodes but um book mindset and just the the matrix of things that I label myself as not good at or things that I can't improve on or I am this person or that person. Um, I make a matrix of those things and whether I have a growth or a fixed mindset. So it'd literally just be the like topics on the left um, and then up top as the columns fixed or growth. And I've never done that exercise and not found multiple places in my life where it really just sort of amounts to making excuses like ah, I was born this way or I was brought up this way just is what it is. And then you're like, do I have free will? Do I have the ability to dig in and, and make a change in what I'm doing? And that mindset, I think, is a precursor to seeing the world around you and realizing what you can take on from other people. Because, again, if you're like really guarded about who you are and have labeled yourself with all of these different identifiers and then you watch somebody else do something that you think you can't do you're probably going to be triggered and a lot of people when they are triggered you know end up probably being a dick about it either to themselves to the person you know whatever sort of in their head so um i just i feel like i learned so much from that because i was part of the like front line back in the day of fighting off power lifters and Olympic weightlifters and people who are like, Teenation. what you're doing is, yeah, what you're doing is stupid. You guys don't know what's going on. And then it's like, you finally just realize that they wrote that article because they could get 10,000 hits on their blog. Um, it's like, oh, okay, well, I guess I don't need to fight each person online that brings this stuff up. And I think it also was complicated because I was going to them for quote unquote advice already. I was going to those websites and you gotta sift reading through about that stuff. R- rest pause and 531 and texas method and all these different things and those same people were calling us morons and i was in my early 20s um and just fucking very confused and fired up simultaneously (laughs) um so one piece of this is the idea of being process oriented and breaking things up into their component parts so like i learned how to move in crossfit through basically like 0.25 playback speed on YouTube. Or at a certain point, you could rip them and put them into coach's eye and you had the like scrubbing wheel, like the really slow sort of movement. Um, I and still I think got coach's as, eye. I'm never fucking deleting it. Dude, if I, I, I coach's eye and yak it. Yak it was the one where I would make the videos of people's chin moving. Um, those honestly were one of my favorite <laughs> Are you able to port that over, Hunter, if you get a new phone? Or, like, you just destined to have an iPhone 11 for the rest of your life? Uh, I don't Serious know. Question, I, don't I, don't know. Remember, I don't remember when Coach's Eye was retired. I, I think... 06? Well, yeah, well, I'm just <laughs> trying to think about it relative to when I got my last new phone, which I only get a new phone when the previous one is completely toast, but doesn't matter. I there still have the is... notification that's like, reminder, Coach's Eye retirement. And I'm like, wrong, bitch. I still got it. <laughs> 78 golf videos on it. Oh, I can't think of the name <laughs> Never of it right now, but there's it. another there's another app that's just like that and it's a on bit form? more user fr- Yes. That's the that one, you one showed me. it's so easy to do a shared folder with an athlete. Like you can save them particular folders inside of the app and then share it with an athlete instead of having to like export the coach's eye video and do September all that. September so 15th, can... 2022. All right. That's when it died. <laughs> Is that your calendar? Coach's eye retirement reminder. Yeah. (laughs) That's so great. It's in it's in the notifications on the app. It's like retirement Uh, reminder. All right, sorry. Didn't mean to derail that, but so basically understanding that like these things are the 
the idea of dissecting movement and you just as an athlete learning how to do muscle ups better, snatches better, whatever it is, or a coach learning how to teach it, um, like breaking down the movement into the pieces and you get to see and, and one of the things that was really fascinating was as we got into crossfit you know we talk about things like the metcon snatch or clean and it's this like bastardized version of the original intent or um the shapes that we try to create in high rep gymnastics versus like a set of gymnastics that are either there to create amazing positioning to transfer to another movement or to be just beautiful in presentation because that's what you're being scored on within gymnastics. So I was just like always wondering why, why can this person do that many more muscle ups than everybody else? Because I don't believe when you watch everything else, you watch them run, you watch them row lift. They're within this percentage of, you know, they're just a few points ahead or behind of everybody else. Um, and that's how the sport goes at the highest level. Why can this, why is this person such an outlier? And you start to see that these same people move the exact same way. They create the same shapes. Um, and early on, it was super fascinating because there were like really big leaps in what people were doing. We went from like everyone on the false grip and the muscle up to then at one point, the standard was you had to turn your hands out at the bottom. And I think that was obviously more squirrel. based on exactly. So then you saw people get rid of their false grip and maintain the like hands facing out disgusting internally rotated position at the bottom where they like he float up the, the back, back of your head. Yep. Um, <laughs> to someone realizing that a neutral shoulder is probably going to make it a little bit easier to do fucking muscle ups. Um, or the perfect pike position, you know, getting you into a more uprise style muscle up versus swinging your feet out in front of you further and then bending the knee to create a like a more vertical hip pocket. So just these things where you can make a huge difference in the way that you move or the way that you coach movement by watching very closely people that move incredibly well and trying to figure out what the difference is. Um, and it's not hard to to put videos side by side and be like, what? Why can this person lift so much more weight than me? When I feel like we have, you know, maybe we have a similar back squat and split jerk or something like that. At its core, to me, that's that's just a comprehension as a coach or an athlete of the fundamentals of like these movements. I tell this to like our classes all the time, like. If you do CrossFit all, like for long enough and act and you have to pay attention to, that's the big caveat. Like if you just do CrossFit and don't pay attention, like whatever, but you're not going to understand it. But if you pay enough attention, you realize that all of the shapes, all of the positions, like there's only the, the of the what hundred, probably close to a hundred movements that might get programmed in a CrossFit gym. There's, you know, 10% of just repeated movement patterns over and over again. Like, you know, the lunge, the squat, the pull, all of these mechanical, the, you know, hollow and arch position in gymnastics, like, uh, like the, the fundamental component parts of those movements are all the same and they all kind of extrapolate out to the more complex movements. And when you can understand that as a coach and you understand the foundational movements, that's when it becomes a lot easier to identify nuances in athletes based on their their own individual capacity and movements. Maybe there's a component of I'm really like I, I I pay really close attention to people's like body types and what you know someone why does somebody struggle to reach parallel it's like oh it's because their you know their femurs are so short and their tibias are so long and like there's this, there's a body proportion element to what makes somebody much more proficient at one thing versus another um, and also like understanding but uh, this is probably even a, a step further and benefits me because of like my engineering background, but like understanding basic physics and biomechanics of like the way joints move and how leverage is created and stuff like that opens up a world of comprehension of why and how to make things easier and why you might see someone, you know, why is the power position so important and why does it look slightly different in, you know, Lu Xiaojun of a Chinese weightlifter compared to Dmitry Klokov, you know, of Russia. And it's like you pay attention to their body types and how they obviously there's a training, a big 
training and methodological difference, but for the most part, there's the foundational component that applies to everybody. And then from there, the nuance gets added based on the athlete. And obviously the higher, the more, spe- uh, the more, uh, I guess, specific you get into your sport, the more specialized, that's what I'm looking for, the the more nuances and deviation there's going to be. But for the average, you know, athlete and for the average CrossFitter and even for the competitive CrossFitter, like we're not trying to create a squat snatch that looks like Lu Xiaojun or Dmitry Klokov. We're trying to get the fundamentals of the positions, you know, the setup position, the power position, getting appropriate leverage out in front of the knee, and then, you know, hopefully having the the requisite mobility and range of motion to achieve a sound bottom position. But all of these things are just bare bones kind of barrier to entry. And once you can understand how much carryover these fundamentals have from movement to movement, it becomes a lot easier to understand why certain people, uh, you know, are better at one thing than the other. And therefore, you know, you can make adjustments for your athletes or your coaches based on that knowledge. I mean, we talk about this at the gym here with our coaches meetings with, uh, you know, everybody like there are like six universal like motor patterns. It's like upper body pulling, pressing, lower body pulling, lower body pressing, core movements and cyclical movements like a machine. Like outside of that, like every other movement we do in the gym kind of falls into one of those categories. I can't think of one that wouldn't fall into it if you include like upper body pressing, also including like static holds and whatnot, like if you can recognize the patterns in movement, like it's very easy to take something that's super complicated, like a squat snatch or a clean and jerk and relate them to, you know, the deadlift, a relatively simple lift compared to the clean and jerk. And that's, you know, you can recognize those patterns and what changes here. That's how you take a coach who doesn't know, you know, the ins and outs of like, how do I correct? There's so many things going on in the clean and jerk. How do I fix one of the things? I'm like, well, like go back and think about things that are universally accepted in the deadlift. Obviously some positions change, but like a lot of the same things that happen here and if you can relate to that, you can pay attention to the fundamentals. Like, are the feet in the right place? Are the hips in the right spot relative to the shoulders? And then from there, you can develop a more nuanced appreciation for how things change with body types, different styles, like you were just alluding to, Hunter. And that is kind of the way to bridge the gap between like really dialing in the the fundamentals. And like one of the things I've been doing recently is going back and reading the, the level one uh, CrossFit manual. And you just look at like what was in there I don't know, 15 years ago when Greg wrote it. And it basically encapsulates everything that you would need to know as a as a teacher of human movement, both from like an individual who's trying to get better at the sport of CrossFit or a coach of that um, endeavor. And it's not as complicated as it may seem if you can relate the movements to each other. There's a reason why there's a logical progression from the air squat to the front squat to the overhead squat or you know, the deadlift to the sumo deadlift high pole to the medicine ball clean. I just, there's a lot of, I mean, I don't, I don't think he gets enough, Greg gets enough credit for how ingenious that document is. I know that there's, you know, it's over years, it's changed a bit and there's some nuance that's, you know, come and gone from the book and, you know, maybe they don't teach the zone diet the way they say used to in the past, but that, that book is probably the most important thing ever written about uh, health and wellness or fitness ever. And if you haven't re- read it recently, I would encourage you to you know go on Amazon, spend the fifty bucks, and read it again, and take your time with it because it's it's really profound. We just had a a, a a couple of physical therapists at our gym did a one hour seminar this past weekend on uh, basically like one of them asked me like, hey, what what would you guys like to see? And I said our athletes really struggle with the concept of posterior chain engagement, uh, which is one of like the found like the fundamentals of functional movement and when we're talking about the basics here you know you can we can talk about the fundamentals of gymnastics and the hollow and arch we can talk about the fundamentals of weightlifting but the fundamentals of crossfit for me is the you know is functional movement and the characteristics of functional movement the idea of core to extremity, active shoulder, midline engagement, posterior chain engagement, uh, you know, range of motion about a joint. All of these things are the, are the fundamentals of like the CrossFit methodology of a whole, which is predicated on the idea that we're using functional movements, which also, by the way, has, you know, definitions associated with it. The most important kind of being the, it moves large loads, long distances quickly. You know, the difference between a leg extension and a back squat is, you know, hopefully everybody listening to this can understand that the difference in those two things. But 
that's the that is the to me the crossfit equivalent is the you know the l1 manual and the under the understanding of what you know what is constantly varied mean what is functional movement mean what does intensity mean because all of these things have associated definitions with them and then they also have kind of you know what are the facets of functional movements like well here are six things that define functional movement and then th there's basically there there is an answer to most of these questions right v with whether it's an outside sport a, you know a specialized sport like weightlifting or crossfit you know crossfit has the level one manual effectively as it's kind of you know bible for understanding what we should be looking for as coaches and athletes and if you don't have the foundational movements that you guys are referencing like we're talking about not having the foundation to build towards basically everything else and i think people get really caught up in you know I mean, obviously we do too, because we've been talking about, or at least I have been talking about things like muscle ups and squat snatch, but I go back to one of my first like major light bulb moments as an athlete and a coach was the wall ball and just like w watching other people for the most part, it was a squat jump and throw. That's what that movement was for a very long time. How do you get a 20 pound ball to hit a 10 foot target Still if you don't? Game jump and throw yeah he's an interesting example in this in this conversation two step. but Gabe, two step. there were just people who had a similar level of fitness and size that could do them all day and it looked boring and it's just like I, I have to know what the fuck is going on here so same thing iphone negative six 3gs on the edge network um <laughs> And you're you're filming these people and you're looking at okay johnny's super fit johnny hates wall balls Bob isn't even that fit and he loves wall balls. What's going on here? And they all looked like their feet were glued to the floor, the people who were crushing the wall ball. So we break that down and it's like, oh, it's a squat and throw? <laughs> like we back squat, we front squat, we thruster. Like some people look like they're trying to jump with a thruster and that's also not super correct. Um, but you think about not only is the best way to, to stand up weight to, to reach that full knee extension with your weight evenly distributed on your foot. Like if you can stand up, you know, 300, 400 pounds in your back squat, um, you can't throw a 20 pound ball to a nine or 10 foot target with that same movement pattern. Um, and it's not just like obviously a single rep. It's very easy to throw a ball up to a target with your jump, but think about your stabilizing muscles and what kind of work, they're being put in. So not only is it like a little bit too dynamic, um, we joke about the people that look like they're gonna throw a dumbbell through the roof. Um, you don't get extra points for, you know, velocity on a 50 pound dumbbell um, in a dumbbell snatch. You should just do what you gotta do to get the thing over your head. Um, same idea with that jump, much more metabolically demanding. You're actually moving a longer distance um, with your body, but then you have to get your ass back into that squat position every single time. You think about what that would do to you. like. I bet a jump and throw Karen for the same athlete versus a feet planted Karen would be like two X soreness on the jump and throw version of having to get yourself back into that position. Our members can confirm. Yeah. And <laughs> this extrapolates out to again, like a lot of not that fit people who love double unders. They probably keep their hand pretty low. Um, <laughs> sorry, sure. Um, they probably keep their hand pretty low, use a fairly short rope and don't breathe like a, you know, a dolphin, um, you know, at a trick show, sure. Um, while they're doing them box jumps, like all of these things, these, these foundational movements, and then what they turn out into, you can learn how to, you can reverse engineer the way anyone else in your gym moves. Like if you don't know them that well, maybe ask if you can film them. Um, that might, nah. that might be like a little creepy, but it takes the fun. Out I of just, it. there are people out in the gym here that I envy so much based on their work capacity and their like ability to put their head down and go. And then I can't relate to them in any way, shape or form when we're trying to figure out a movement together. They're just like, I suck. I can't do it. I, I don't have this. I don't have that. I'm not this. I'm, you know, not athletic or I'm not strong. And it's just like, have you like remove complexity from the movement and it's incredible what you're able to accomplish. And it's like, 
crazy to me and i know that this is like coach's brain taking over it's crazy to me that they wouldn't just film bobby you know doing muscle ups and then look at themselves and be like oh wow this these do not look similar at all like i can actually change the way that i move i think a lot of it too comes down to just learning styles for athletes right it's yeah, like you, you know sure. how you for me one of the something that has really benefit me as i've got further and further into playing golf is the is actually the one the appreciation of the fundamentals because i've i found a book that's been like a significant game changer for me like uh by one of the greatest golfers of all time uh, he wrote it was like ben the hogan? five yeah ben hogan the five lessons that's um, one that's a famous the, book for non-golfers just based on the way yeah that dude, he just fundamentals of golf and like 50 percent of the book is all static it's all like how do you put your hand on the golf club how do you set up to address the ball and like it's just just like in just like setting up for a snatch like if you can get put your hands on the right spot get your hips at the right level engage the correct musculature all of which before any any kinetic movement happens you've 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 done 75 percent of the work you've put yourself into a position to not have to think about the dynamic portion of the movement and and you know successfully complete the the lift the golf swing whatever it is um and i think people just overlook that and to the point you were making is like drew the slow it down sort of thing we we're blessed with the technology you know we have the technology to be able to do that and be able to scrub at you know a hundred i don't know what's a high frame rate ted 100 frames per second is that good that's super high 120? 120 okay whatever whatever it is 80 frames per second 60 frames per second on an iphone no, whatever is like divisible by 30 bro shut the fuck up ted i'm on the roll here <laughs> uh does it really why does it have to be divisible by three 30 so 30, 30 frames per second is your standard frame rate for internet video, what you shoot on your phone. So in order to slow it down, you need to have something divisible by 30. Otherwise, you'll be jumping frames. That's why when you shoot at regular speed and then you try to drop it to 50%, it's like frame, pause, frame, pause, because there's no data in between. No, the more you know. <laughs> But the point Continue. is, the point is, is the, the fundamental, the, you know, learning, understanding one, the difference between like static and dynamic positioning. And then, um, just, yeah, using, using the fact that we can pay attention, like you could find a video of the best weightlifter in the world and slow it down and see exactly what they're doing. For me, there's no, there's far less of an excuse for coaches or athletes to not be able to like dig a little bit and identify you know those those commonalities i mean anyone that comes to the gym and takes a class again going back to the snatch or cleaning jerk you can't hold a setup position for fucking 15 seconds while i walk around and give corrections like you don't need to worry about how heavy the bar is bud you need to figure out right why here, you can't dude. hold this Fuck. position why can't you hold these positions that's where more value lies in today's session than anything else until you can sit in those positions comfortably it doesn't really matter that you want to snatch 225 you can't get yourself in the position to even do it like you can't hold a pvc pipe for 15 seconds let's fix that first let's talk about the fundamental positions you need to get in you can't sit in the bottom of your overhead squat there's another spot you can spend time in before you worry about how heavy the bar is like there's these against they call it the novices curse the, the desire to jump ahead to intermediate and advanced skills before the basics are mastered and it's because the basics are boring but the basics are where most people stand to gain the most well, that brings me back to when we really misunderstood a lot of what was being said at the beginning of CrossFit, because even doing it, quote unquote, wrong worked pretty well. CrossFit done poorly <laughs> like you still got, works really well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like like the first the first workout that I ever first CrossFit workout I ever did, I did jumping muscle ups. <laughs> Sick. Like that was my first CrossFit workout. I did a variation of Nasty Girls day one. Um, and the rings were too low to really be able to swing at all. So it was like false grip, jump, dip every single time. Um, but you made so much progress back then because of how hard you went, regardless of, you know, normally if there were muscle ups, it's probably air squats sprinkled in or, you know, burpees or pull ups or something of that nature. And, um, we got away from that, I think for a while until CrossFit took over programming for competitions. 
and reminded us that no one cares that you love 30 muscle ups for time in DT. Like if you can't do fucking burpees and run and do toes to bar and double unders and row, like n- absolutely positively no one cares. And I think it probably took a lot of restraint and foresight to program that way because at that time, everyone was pissed about it. It was like double unders and power snatch. Ugh. Like, what is that? I thought this was going to be like like backflip, muscle up, you know, 285 shoulder to overhead, like that sort of thing. Um, and yeah, I just, I'm <laughs> just laughing thinking about like That's... so many of us wanted to be able to do, like we trained to be so that we could do muscle ups. I want to show yeah, off. Yeah, to me, that makes me, that makes me think about the same, the same kind of principle as far as like, hey, let's in a in a in a 60 minute crossfit class it's like well we can get people really fit with just doing this one thing that crossfit recommends i bet we can get people twice as fit by doing a lift and a metcon and it's like double under power snatch like what like that's not hard like do the double under and then yeah like let's just try not to like snap yourself in half with the power snatch and we'll cram these two things into that 60 minute class but you're probably going to do both of them you know at average qual average quality at best and a lot of it was just like what the fuck am i going to talk about with a double under power snap how am i going to fill 60 minutes of you know value i don't have and what that's actually saying is is like you don't have enough depth of knowledge to create value for that 60 minutes it's like i can fuck how many like how many recent weeks have we had where it was like we had an eight minute workout that was attached to like push-ups and pull-ups and sherb and i or, or some of the coaches would be like man i could have i could have gone that done just that eight minute workout in class and i would have buried everybody like i could have hammered just absolute bare bones fundamentals for 30 minutes let everybody take a piss and then just buried them with that eight minute metcon and it would have been way more than any like it would have been perfect. It would have been plenty for that one sixty minutes of class. Not like, hey guys, like let's get that quick warm up in. Okay, you got six minutes to get to your first ninety percent back squat. It's like, yeah, no shit. What like, obviously that back squat looks terrible. Like we didn't do anything to prepare for it. We didn't educate athletes. We didn't, you know, the coach didn't actually know what they were doing. They kind of hid behind the fact that we got to keep this train rolling because there's only sixty minutes in the class. And I think that's still prevalent today, although it's I think it's gotten a lot better. I think there's a a much broader realization that it's like, hey, you should like that 60 minute CrossFit class is really well suited for one. And if it's two really short things or if it's two things, they're pretty short and they're fairly simple. And that's even like you could even make the argument that that's part of like you know, Glassman talks about that. We're going to spend 15 minutes working on skills, uh, you know, working on handstands. And then we're going to finish with, you know, a three to five round gymnastics, like burner that just sets you on fire or something like that. And that's, that's how you get people fitter, but it all starts with teaching those fundamentals and getting people to actually not accept like good enough because it, it's not. Yeah. I mean, today's class is five sets of front squats, five, four, three, two, one, and you have 60 minutes to do it. And if you're looking at your, uh, you're playing you're like, how the fuck am I going to fill an hour with this? That speaks to, and again, don't take this the wrong way, but current inadequacy, inadequacy in your own like acumen as a coach. Like you need to find a way through Or you placate education. too much. I think that's yeah. a huge part of, I mean, yes. of this equation is you might have the information that you guys are referencing and you're too nervous as a coach to go out there and deliver a class about front squatting. Like you have to believe in the idea that you're sending the wrong message if you fly through something like that. What does yeah. it mean about a person's health and mobility and well-being if they can do a heavy front squat? Like, you have to check off like a thousand boxes to make yeah. that happen. And if it's a fucking throwaway in your class, you can't get that across to the members. They right. didn't go to fucking F45 or Orange Theory for a reason. And on some days, they might not want to hear it. And you you do it anyways to send the message so that they can figure out like, hey, I'm leaving this class and Hunter walked up to me and was like, you look like you're air squatting with that barbell there. We might need to get some weight on. And they're like, oh, I thought that was heavy. And it's like, no, that's not heavy. That's not what heavy looks like. <laughs> you, your face is not red. You stood up too easy. It was easy to rack and unrack. Like, that's not heavy. Try again. 
Tefa takes lots of practice, but again, I think that's I I think one common mistake there too is that like coaches that run that class, like there's not enough force foresight into like what appropriate warming up of tissue looks like. What does it look like to access the range of motion? What does it look like to to cue athletes through enough reps that they're ready? I think one of the biggest mistakes CrossFit coaches make is that like they have a good general warm up. They might do some activation. They will look at like six reps of a fucking empty bar or PVC pipe and we're like, eh, looks like a front squat kind of have at it. And then people are done, you know, 40 minutes in the class. I'm like, what the fuck do I do now? A finisher? Do I do like fucking ab day at the gym? Do I, you know, tell them to do 10 burpees for time? Like, what does that day look like? Whereas I like, I think, go ahead. Go ahead, Sherb. No, I was going to say that the part that's, that's left out of there is that like, people don't recognize, or at least I think I see often at the affiliate level is like, you know, one of the best ways to warm people up, hold them in positions and call out lots and lots and lots of reps. They are paying you to refine the way that they move so they can be healthier human beings outside the box. You need to drill them through enough reps that everybody makes a noticeable improvement or to learn something in that class. That is one of the main components to a successful affiliate class. You know, we want people to have fun, we want them to have safe, and we hopefully want them to learn something as they get fitter. Want them to yeah, have I think safe. the, I think the, um, perhaps there's an element there too of like when you, it, like whether you're a competitive coach or, or you know an affiliate coach, if you don't have, if you're not providing athletes with that sort of like depth of whether it's a warm up mobility you know the the actual teaching of the lift if you just if you skirt past all of that humans are incredibly incredible at compensation or figuring out ways to work around you know whatever it is that their their issue is we've had an athlete who came up to me and was just like hey like you know i really struggle to get in that front rack position what do we think about this guy the hands over the chest the hands across the shoulders sort of thing and i was like Listen, like I, that's, that's kind of a last, that's a worst case scenario sort of thing. If you're in pain, like let's talk about it. But if it's like this position's uncomfortable because I sit at a desk most of the day and like my wrists are getting a little bit of a stretch by being in this front rack position, it's like, yeah, that's fine. Like you're going to be okay. And to me, the coach who's like, who is able to, dissect the movement not necessarily in front of their athletes every single time but if if the coach doesn't have the answer as an answer to that sort of question that's when the athletes are like well like i'll figure out a way to work around the hard parts of this movement it's the same it's the same thing that cr competitive crossfitters did when competitive crossfit started to become a thing and the level of coaching wasn't probably there to support it right they're like the co half the people who were those competitive athletes were the coaches and it was just like i'm just gonna do whatever i can do to minimize the you know to make sure that i'm compensating where i need to to learn how to do this movement in order to beat x y so you know so and so in this race and there is that is valid to a certain extent for competitive CrossFitters, but that only comes after like that foundation has been laid so deeply that you understand what what's like you understand what the front squat is supposed to look like. You understand what muscles are supposed to be engaging when. And then from there, like that's when the nuance of your, you know, your 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 personal idiosyncrasies start to come into play to me. And that's the reason that I got into that book so heavily. It's like Here's like the four things. It's like your grip, your stance and your posture, the backswing, the downswing. It's like that's four things. And the way that the book is written, it's like there is like literally every single word in that book has value as far as like I could go. I've I've read it like five times since I got it like two weeks ago. It's nuts. And that's just how my brain processes information. It's like how how deep into the detail weeds can I get how can I can I revisit this thing because I'm like seeing the progress so there must be something to this like idea of the fundamentals being so deeply ingrained in how you move and how you you know how you operate that once you have those fundamentals then you can start to potentially create nuance based on you know your body type your physical limitations your mobility your your you know, your what feels comfortable, et cetera. But that only comes after those basics, those foundations have been uh, 
really, really perfected. Yeah, I um I, I think I've mentioned this before, but I really got would get so bored in high school. We had the an old school football coach and we just had we didn't have very many plays that we ran and he just made us perfect every step that we took over and over and over. And like the first time you're under center and you hear the linebacker call sweep, it's kind of unnerving. You're like, they know what play we're gonna do. What do I do? Like I'll fucking time out, like whatever. And then like five games later, they'd call it and I'd be like, it's going to be like a 46 yard run anyway. So you guys do whatever the fuck you <laughs> want for this play. But it was because you got in trouble if you didn't have your like follow through that had nothing to do with the play or this person was out of place or that person was out of place in any way. And as a teenager, that's really tough to wrap your mind around because practice is just the same fucking thing over and over and over. <laughs> like your three-step drop was trash. Well, I did 27 good ones. It's like, okay, well, where's the fucking 28th good one? Like, yeah. th- I don't care what you did before. The next rep is like the only rep sort of a thing. Um, but I think I brought a lot of that with me to coaching Um as I got older and it took me a little while to realize it. And it's just like a little bit of a smirk thinking back on those things. And it really just is a willingness to like give into that. And it, the only, the like final thing that I wrote down in my notes for this episode was the, um, my least favorite people on earth, uh, the must be nice people, that mentality of watching another coach crush it or watching an athlete move with grace, um, in, in saying that to yourself as a defense mechanism, um, you know, must be nice to be born charismatic or passionate about this thing or whatever it is versus the incredible amount of time and attention to detail that it took for that person to get there. If that exact same person walked out into the gym and like really just put their ego down for a minute and as the coach watched, you could watch anyone any single person coach an affiliate class as a coach and learn something from them. Anyone, a one out of 10 and a nine out of 10, you could learn something. There's nuance in there. There's something about the way that they communicated with a particular person, the way that they, you know, sort of circled back with someone. There's a million different examples of what it could be, but instead of like finding, like, I think a lot of times if someone is really good at a particular thing, a coach will find what they're not good at. And that's the narrative that they have in their head because it's an attribute that they want to have. And on the athlete side, it's the same thing. There are athletes that you really, you know, get bogged down in the details of movement and probably need to learn how to put their head down and work from somebody else and vice versa. But if you open yourself up to those things and walk into the gym with that mentality that we were asked to have as athletes and coaches when CrossFit started, like there are people that know how to coach this movement better than you, program this movement better than you, perform this movement better than you. That's amazing. That's not bad. Like you don't need to bring your ego into this. It's like, holy shit, I could go learn from someone who's world-class at a particular thing. And then I think the reason it stuck with me is I need the variance. I need the different modalities. I think I would have, if I had picked one of the things, I always got bored after a period of time, but I still haven't gotten bored with this because there's still so much to be able to improve on and learn from moving, coaching, programming, the whole fucking thing. I mean, a good habit as a coach that would also apply to an athlete is like every time you're about to go do something for the day, you can just pick one of the things you're about to do, whether that's coach a single movement or if you're an athlete about to go to a triplet, look at one of the, pick one of the movements and go to YouTube and just type that movement in and you'll learn something. If you check, if you pick a different video every single time, you'll pick up something useful from a video that you maybe have never heard before. And then every once in a while, if you cycle back to a video you've watched before, like, ah, you know what? I never paid attention to this one element that you just mentioned that I've heard this video five times, but for some reason this time, this part of the video stuck. Like, I think that's a really good habit for a coach. There are, I don't even know how many zillions of videos on fucking YouTube there are for front squat, back squat, air squat, all the movements that you teach in CrossFit classes and say, all right, I haven't watched this video before. Like I'm going back and watching some of the videos from fucking 2011. You hear things, you know, being brought up of like, you know, how to, how to do a you know, back roll to support. There's a video of Greg teaching how to do someone, you know, teach someone a back roll to support in 2011. And like, I had never seen that video before. Like I thought I had seen just about everything that they had ever put out there that related to Greg. I hadn't seen it before. And I was like, oh, that's really smart. And that's something I could then take to an affiliate class next time. 
that we're doing another movement, maybe not a back roll to support, but a skin the cat or something like that. And just talking about how that can relate to those two movements. And then now I can provide value to a class that I didn't previously have before because I didn't know what I didn't know what I didn't know. And now I know that thing. So it's a really easy habit to have, you know, don't get stuck in the way of teaching something the same way every single time because you're going to stagnate. And then, you know, you're worried about delivering the best class that you ever can. And you overhear someone else giving cues that you never heard before. It's like, Hey, there's something you could have delivered to your class that you don't now, you know, hopefully that lights a fire under your ass. Like, you know, I need to be able to teach this movement as good as so-and-so in my class teaches this movement. And that, you know, both motivates you to get better. And that pushes that person to get better because they want to be, you know, constantly leveling each other up in your affiliate. Sure. Isn't it amazing that we knew everything there was to know about anything when we were 24 and over 10 years later, we know way more nothing. and we know that we know nothing. Yeah, yeah nothing. Kinda, <laughs> life is real fun like that. I know nothing. <laughs> yeah. The, a lot of what we're talking about to me is a, is a young man's game. Um, and it would suck to stay in that headspace for a long period of time. If your pursuit was to be a better athlete, to be a better coach. Have to do it. You gotta be willing to do it. All right, Good gentlemen, idea. final thoughts time. How does someone use this? You can go coach, I'm gonna, you can go athlete. Yeah, I'll go coach and I'll, I'll I'm going to tail a little bit off of Sherb's last comment and what what he said it has has tremendous value. I think the word of caution that I would give somebody. So he you kind of Sherb you were like there's a million videos on YouTube of how to, you know, how to teach X Y or Z. And that is both a blessing and a curse. I, I would encourage you as an athlete or a coach to find, you know, and it's even difficult to trust through what a, or, or to sift through what would be considered quote, a trusted source for information. But there's also a lot of bullshit out there. Um, there's a lot of bad information and there's a lot of people out there with, you know, the boom of the, you know, tech boom, social media, the, the internet in general, where people are vying for your attention more so than they're concerned with you learning how to say perform a squat snatch correctly. Um, it's to it's to find a you know a trusted source, and I would I typically feel like an in person coach or you know someone who you can seek speak with like remotely um, who doesn't have you know seven thousand at like oh I got eight thousand subscriptions be one of my athletes it's like you're not one of their athletes you're you're a dollar amount in a bank account and it's the same thing when you go onto youtube and say how to air squat and you're one of six million views on that video it's like that person is you know the, there's basically the 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 heed the caution of try to find someone or a resource that you trust for crossfit to me, it's like, yeah, it is the level one man. It's the, it's the training manuals. It's the CrossFit journal. It is those kind of like primary source documents and, you know, the original sort of information, you know, folks who were putting out that information, you know, in 2008, 2007, um, and, and start there. Then once you have a firm grasp on those found, you know, fundamentals, foundational movements, whatever it is, uh, from kind of that primary source, that gives you the kind of the ability to look and see, watch, you know, the next video that you get served. It's like, okay, that's bullshit. Or, okay, I see you why this person is trying to teach it this way. Uh, and I'm going to take a little bit from this person, but I'm not going to take the whole thing because I, I have, you have that foundational knowledge that you can build upon, but just make sure that you're not doing the shotgun blast of like, yep, I'm taking something from there, from there, from there, from there. And it's all correct because it's probably not. You have to have that foundational knowledge in order to create that web outward, you know, to be able to have 12 different cues for the front squat or to be able to teach six different types of athletes how to do the muscle up with the foundations and the fundamentals in mind. So uh, just be careful out there, kids. The internet's a dangerous place. <laughs> it's not even just the fucking internet. The amount of authors that lied to me when I, like, in my 20s, I'm still fucking, I'm not even oh, mad yeah, at them. Oh, yeah, it's I'm like, oh, that guy wrote a book. It's like, okay, like, that guy qualified to write a book? What What you mean is that guy wrote words and somebody published them and you bought it. Like, that doesn't mean they're <sighs> qualified. <laughs> I thought they were qualified, Hunter, and I'm not like a, I'm a pretty, like, like you I'm not a naive idiot. person. I knew like that I at 24. To, you, to you grab Dave Asprey told me that yak butter was going to save my life. <laughs> 
didn't it? But like even the so, <laughs> Kiefer so, told me to eat twelve donuts after I front squatted. One of the so one of the nuances it. here is things like most of the paleo books that were written when we started. The science is absolute fucking bullshit. Like sure. dog sounded shit. good. But I think the idea is I know that people will be way healthier if they eat this way and I'll do anything that I can to convince them to do so. So I think that like a lot of those authors still felt altruistic in a way, even though they were fucking lying. Right. Like, well, it's so, even worse yeah. now, right? Because there's even a hu- even bigger competition for your, your time and your attention. Yeah. But uh, man, it's like, how the fuck? I just, I don't know. It was like, oh, I went to Harvard. I wrote this book. Like damn, this must be real. It's not. Now that doesn't even matter. No, it doesn't matter. It doesn't fucking matter. Okay, uh, my final thoughts. um, Just thinking about this again from the standpoint of what could you do with this information from the athlete side? It is so easy to want to be able to move like another athlete, lift as much as them, you know, hold the same paces as them on a machine. Um, and the harder you work and the longer you do it, I think it's potent. It's, you have the potential to be more jaded about it's my genetics or, um, you know, I have a job and they don't Easy like putting out. yourself into that mindset. Um, you have the ability to tinker with, the way that you move, the way that you train, the way that you recover, the way that you do all of these things. And just accepting that like, has been a lot of conversation recently with the CrossFit YouTubers about like genetic potential. And I've still never seen anyone reach their genetic potential. So I'm fucking like, the day that someone comes in, I'm like, that's it. All right, you've gone as far as you possibly can. We can't add five pounds to this lift and also shave 10 seconds off your mile. Like I've, I don't think in our sport without it being specialized that that's ever going to happen. Right. So I sort of hate that excuse. Um, but just shifting your mindset, same exact person. Um, and just knowing that there, you do have the ability to make progress anywhere. We have so many of these examples of athletes that like, you know, you saw maybe on, the outside looking in as an individual for years at regionals, they didn't make it to regionals at all. Then you saw him on a team and then you saw him like maybe at like Wadapalooza as an individual and eventually semifinals in games. And this person like molded themselves from like someone who probably was just a good in their affiliate to going to the CrossFit games. And in some instances we're talking about like, there's some names that I remember from eight to 10 years ago that have now gotten themselves to that spot. And if they had that exact same mindset of, you know, I'm a bigger athlete, I can't do this, I'm not gonna be able to get better at that. Like, you can tell that they went from, if there's pulling gymnastics at semifinals, I'm not going to the CrossFit Games, to like that being a strength of theirs after putting in the amount of time. So um, I think, again, going back to just this, this founding idea of, there's so many amazing examples and teachers and athletes out there that you can learn from. You just have to be willing to like open up for that to be the case. And I saw it through the lens of coaching first, I think. Like just watching these incredible attributes from other coaches like in class and being like, damn, if we could all just pull a little bit from each coach, you could end up having the the kind of coaching staffs that I think we do at our gyms. Yeah, I mean, my, my final thoughts are going to go back to the level one manual. You know, I think this is probably more advice for the, just the everyday CrossFit or the, uh, you know, athlete more so than the coach. But if you go back there and you read the things that Greg thought were all things that we should be able to do, you know, have the capacity of a novice sprinter, weightlifter and gymnast, and you'll be fitter than any human being on earth. If you go back and you look at the different modalities and how he described them and he said, you know, shoot for the ability to do 10 unbroken push-ups, then 20, then 40, then, you know, it gets as crazy as 100. If you look at any of those things and those jump out of you, it's like, that's fucking impossible for me right now. That's where you want to put the eggs in the basket. That's where you want to go and, and work towards. So like something I've been personally uh, working on is the L-sit. I, you know, six months ago, I would consider myself pretty trash at them. Like 10 seconds would be the greatest day of my life for an L-sit. So I said, you know, fuck it. For once a week, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to try to accumulate a session where I do a, you know, a minute of L sitting and as few sets and as little time as possible to do that. 
And when I set out to do it, it was fucking five seconds here. It was seven seconds there. And it took 20 minutes to accumulate a minute. Did it today um, and had a huge PR. I was able to do 30 consecutive seconds of an L sit. And then it took me four and a half minutes to accumulate one minute, whereas it used to take me 20 minutes. And I told myself like- 30 seconds? Fuck. Yeah, it's my, my, honestly, my best by, I was a PR by five I'd seconds. I cramped for a month if I did it for 30 seconds. Well, I did two at first. <laughs> at first, I literally couldn't hold my hip angle closed. I was incapable of doing it. My knees were bent. And, you know, I would do it with a friend here that was also more of a gymnast than anything else at the gym. And, you know, he'd give me things to think, to, tr to loosen up my hamstrings to do it and things I could do as drills to help basically condition my quad to hold a static hold, my legs extended. And, you know, it took probably three months before it got any better. But now, like May, I've been doing it for, I don't know how many weeks it's been since the beginning of the year, but I don't know, 20. And it's already gotten tremendously better. And that's just because I gave it attention for a week. Think about that for any other thing that you want to do in the gym. If you gave it one day a week where you gave it focused attention and you just worked on it and worked on it and I mean, worked on all, it. Literally what you're saying is you, you just, you, weren't good at something and a lot of people just go I'm, I'm not good at that that's who i am and you were like i bet i can figure this out that's the only fucking difference in this entire equation it goes for coaching too accepting ex absolutely 100 percent. That's, that's exactly how i you know i consider myself a pretty decent affiliate coach and that's literally all i did was like i'm gonna watch this video and try to put it in class and oh fuck that part was i butchered that or i skipped that part or i forgot this in critical element all right Next class is coming up in 10 minutes. I'm going to do it differently this class and just keep retooling it and retooling it and retooling it. And over time, you become a, you know, either a really good athlete because you fix the things that you didn't pay attention to before and you fixed or same thing for coaching. Anything else, Hunter? No. Do we do it? Yes. Thank you for tuning into another episode of the Misfit Podcast. Words. And thank you to our show sponsors, properfuel.co. Use the code word MISFIT sharpentheaxeco.com use your favorite athlete code teammisfit.com for all your affiliate programming needs and misfitathletics.com for your individual programming needs we'll see you next week peace